All right, we're on time, so let's get started. Welcome to the last panel of the day. This is where we look ahead to the upcoming term of the Supreme Court. My name is Christopher Schmidt. I teach here at Chicago Kent College of Law, and I also am director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States here at Chicago Kent. Um, I believe all my panelists have already uh, been on stage today, so I'll just uh, briefly remind you of who we have, and then we're going to jump in. And I have some questions I'll be throwing their way, and then they'll be taking it from there. So I have uh, William J., partner at Goodwin Proctor and co-chair of their appellate litigation practice. Next to him, Thomas Saunders, partner at William, Wil Wilmer Hale. And at the end of the row, we have Greg Riley, assistant professor at California Western School of Law, who's also, I'm glad to say, visiting here at Chicago Kent this term. So to start off, before we look ahead to the upcoming term, we're going to look back briefly uh, at the previous term with one question about what happened uh, last term at the Supreme Court. We had five IP cases. Um, but some people look at these cases and say they didn't actually create a whole heck of a lot of new IP law. They're decided on relatively narrow, perhaps technical grounds. So my question for the panelists would be, is that an accurate characterization of what we saw last term? And are there any cases from uh, last term that you think will have um, a more lasting influence on IP law going forward? Do you want to take that up? I, mean, I, I think for the reasons discussed on the panel today, that the footprint is fairly limited. We, we may see, but given the, the sort of Phillips hierarchy and, and the treatment of intrinsic evidence, it's not clear. A lot of cases, Teva hasn't seemed to have been changing the outcome. Kimball, by definition, didn't change the law. Um, and, you know, t I think that if we have, you know, tacking goes over to likelihood of confusion, then you could see that sort of resolving a simmering circuit split there. And Como is hard because I think the stakes were incredibly high in that case. The federal circuit had sort of found its way to the particular articulation of that rule more recently. So you didn't have something that had been in place for a long time that was being undone. It was just a period of uncertainty. So I don't, I don't think this is a term where you have things like Nautilus or Alice coming out of it that are just launching whole new uh, fights in litigation. Yeah, I'd largely agree. I mean, I, I, my, my specialty is patent. I don't think any of the patent cases are cases that are going to be uh, uh, fundamental game changers. You know, I, of, the, of the cases, I actually think uh, the B and B hardware case may be the most significant. I think this issue of the relationship of administrative proceedings and court proceedings has larger impact than than certainly just trademark law or IP law generally. And with all of the uh, post grant procedures uh, now in the patent office, uh, I, I, it's an increasing question. The relationship. Yeah, I mean, if we have to choose, you know, from among these cases, I think that's probably a good answer. That the uh, th there are the ones that change the law at all. Uh, there's probably a degree of work going on, uh, including uh, including B and B. But uh, but you know, for example, this is the first time in you know decades that the Supreme Court has actually applied preclusion to an administrative proceeding and said that presumptively administrative proceedings are entitled to preclusion. And you, know, and you could see that having uh, effects not only in trademark and not only even IP cases, but in uh, cases more broadly. So now turning our attention to the upcoming term, as Ed mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the court is not granted cert uh, for any IP cases uh, for the upcoming term, although there are a, a number that we'll talk about that they might still um, take a look at. Dating back to 1960, uh, there's only been three terms which the court has not heard any uh, intellectual property cases. So I guess the question is, assuming for the sake of argument that they actually don't pick up any of these IP cases, um, what do we think is going on here? Might the court be suffering some IP fatigue after the binge that's been going on for the last few, few terms? I mean, I don't think it's going to drop out. I think that, that the extraordinary, you know, eight case term is the aberration. And there was a little IP fatigue coming out of that. But I think it's just too important to the economy, particularly if you're looking across trademark, copyright, and patent that I would be surprised if we didn't have something this term. And the reality is there's still a lot of issues on which we have fundamental disputes. The Federal Circuit has been very active in its bank practice. Um, and so the, that's also sort of throwing off potential candidates. Now, 
there's always uncertainty of the timing. You know, will will stuff hit this term or, or get granted and carry over the next? But I don't think that I don't think that it's fatigue in the sense that they're going to pull back and not be taking these cases. Right, and, and on the timing point, you know, to the extent that the court tries to use the Solicitor General as its filtering mechanism for some of the patent cases because it can't look for splits and it's not sometimes it's not sure itself which patent cases are important. So if it's going to ask the Solicitor General for his views, those briefs tend to come in in clusters. And that means that the grants come in clusters too on the cases that have been together. And I mean, I think, uh, it, I think it's hard to make too many judgments, uh, uh, both at this point and on one term. It, it, to some extent, it's just, uh, 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 it could just be a fluke in terms of uh, the funnel that's coming up that we don't have any at this point. There's a number of big, of in-bank uh, cases that will be entering the pipeline or just entering the pipeline uh, and, and other kind of significant uh, decisions. So I, I don't know that we can read much into it yet. So looking ahead to this upcoming term, the court actually has taken on uh, one case which involves a state income tax on an investor's license from his patented invention. This is a case of Franchise Tax Board of California versus Hyatt. Uh, Tom, would you mind talking about this for a few minutes? Sure, just very briefly. I mean, it, I think the most interesting thing about this case is it involves Gilbert Hyatt, who has is, uh, already made his mark on Supreme Court law, another recent Federal Circuit decision there. Um, what happened in this case is he, he was an inventor, and back in 1991, just before he was expecting a big stream of revenue to come on board, um, he suddenly moved from California to Nevada, um, which would give him some more beneficial income tax treatment on that revenue. Um, California thought this was a sham and that, that he actually hadn't changed his legal residence, and so it wanted a piece of came in. Um, in the process, uh, Hyatt claims that there was an extraordinary campaign of harassment, people looking at his windows, going through his trash, releasing his social security number, and ended up suing California. And so the legal question in the case is one of sovereign immunity, um, in that California, for this type of suit, couldn't be sued in its own courts, couldn't be sued in federal court, but can be sued in Nevada court under a 1979 and so there are two questions here. One is, does the Nevada court have to apply the sovereign immunity rules it applies to itself, to California? Specifically, in this case, it's a statutory cap on damages and a, a prohibition on punitive damages in this context. So the idea is if you're going to pull one sovereign into the state, into another state, um, you can't treat us worse than Nevada would treat itself. And, and I was alluding to this in the Kimball panel, the, the second question is just straight up, should we overrule the, the 1979 precedent that says that despite not being able to sue here or here, that one state could be pulled into another state. Great. So in the high profile case of Google versus Oracle, which involves the copyrightability of software, the Supreme Court has actually denied Cert. And some have said that the court got this one wrong, that maybe they should have taken this case. So I want to throw to my panelists uh, what they think about this. And um, let's start with Greg. So, uh, you know, this is an interesting question. It's certainly a significant case in that this involves uh, uh, the use of Java language to, uh, uh, for on, an, on the Android uh, uh, platform. And, you know, there was significant concern about the decision. Um, and what its impact would be on uh, 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 more broadly, as well as uh, the statutory interpretation they, the, in a pretty significant circuit split. Um, that said, whether the court should have taken it as a kind of theoretical matter, I'm not sure about. I'm not surprised that the court didn't take it, actually. Um, some things you see uh, uh, that, that are suggested are, are not surprising that they didn't, wouldn't take it. The Solicitor General came in opposing uh, cert, and you know the Supreme Court has gone against the Solicitor General's rec uh, uh, recommendation in at least one or two recent IP cases. But still, it's an uphill battle when the Solicitor General comes in and says no on cert. I also thought that um, 
both the respondent and the solicitor general did a fairly good job from their perspective of uh, portraying this really as a dispute about software rather than a dispute about the law, a the dispute about whether this uh, supposed so-called implementing code uh, was whether the supposed, uh, sorry, the so-called declaring code was distinct from implementing code, and they really made the case seem to uh, turn on the distinction between these two forms of code rather than on legal principles, and that combined with the Solicitor General's recommendation against it um, leaves me unsurprised that the court denied cert whether or not it would have been cert worthy. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I think that's right, just the sense that this is a messy case and that the court might end up having some technical detail it has to resolve as a predicate to reaching the legal question is a real stumbling block for the Supreme Court, which institutionally isn't equipped in the same way as the Federal Circuit where some of the judges have expertise or at least their clerkship hiring uh, process is sort of left in the desire to get in-house expertise. And, and one other thing that was at play to, here too was there was actually a remand to the district court uh, for unfair use defense. So the, there had, there was, the issue of liability was still at play here. Um, and again, both the respondent and the solicitor general do a pretty good job of saying, hey, the policy concerns here that are motivating uh, uh, concern about this case can be addressed through fair use, not through uh, uh, the, the question, the statutory question issue. So we couldn't theory see it all back again? Right. So we had a list of cert petitions and uh, cases to watch included in the conference program on pages 54 and 55 of the program. So I just went, we're going to go down to the panelists, uh, starting with Willie, and just say which of these cases are you watching most closely? Which of them do you think has the best chance of uh, the court actually uh, picking them up? So uh, the um, two, two cases that I'm most familiar with are the SCA hygiene case and the um, Gore versus Bard case. And Gore versus Bard uh, is a case well known to uh, people interested in willfulness and enhanced damages because that's a case in which the court set the, uh, the Federal Circuit decided that it was going to review willfulness de novo, at least in part. Uh, that is not what's been presented to the Supreme Court in the cert petition. Instead, uh, you know, there's a basically a billion dollar damages award that, uh, damages plus reasonable royalty and so on, um, that Gore is trying to get blown up based on a, uh, an interpretation of the Patent Act, which says that uh, a, uh, an assignment must be in writing, and a, an applicant patentee or his blah, 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 may in like manner grant and convey an exclusive right you know, under his application. In other words, an exclusive license, they say, must be in writing. And the plaintiff in this case purports to be an exclusive licensee, but it does not have a writing. So that, in theory, would blow up this entire litigation for a lack of standing. I think that the respondent in this case has done an extremely good job of explaining why the question might not be presented and why it's not why it shouldn't be reviewed anyway, and so on. Uh, so while I expected this case to generate uh, some further issues, I thought they would be related to willfulness. Uh, but willfulness is not where the big money was for Gore, and so it put all its chips on this other uh, on this other bet. Um, SCA hygiene is a, is a case about latches uh, as a defense. The uh, uh, no petition has been filed yet. I think the Federal Circuit just decided it on bond uh, in the last week or so. Uh, but it is about whether latches is a defense to uh, a claim for patent damages uh, within the that is brought within the statute of limitations. And then separately, whether latches can be a defense to injunctive relief, which then the Federal Circuit has previously said, no, it can't, which basically got the law exactly backwards. Uh, at least, you know, if, you, if you're used to general principles of equity. Um, I think this could be a candidate for uh, Supreme Court re review potentially, at least I expect it to be sought. Uh, where the en banc court came out was that latches is still available in damages cases despite the Supreme Court's decision in Petrella, the Raging Bull case, uh, which was discussed at one of these uh, forums, one of these previous forums, uh, that when Congress has set the statute of limitations, that courts are not to make up a 
sort of facts and circumstances based, latches defense uh, based on timeliness. That's not the case here, said the Federal Circuit, because Congress in the Patent Act basically codified all defenses that were previously available, and uh, even though it did not mention latches in the Patent Act, there is a sort of catch-all provision uh, in uh, 282, Section 282, uh, that, they that the Federal Circuit majority, uh, you know, six, six judges out of 11 thought it implicitly within the, uh, within the statute. So they said this doesn't raise the problem that uh, was an issue in Trello. Uh, the, on the injunctive piece, the Federal Circuit unanimously and quietly admitted that it had gotten it wrong all along and that latches is available uh, for injunctive, uh, to, de to defeat an injunction. Uh, however, uh, if you are trying to get an ongoing royalty and you want to get that barred based on delay and that's not uh, that's not available. That that has to be brought under the heading of equitable estoppel. So uh, the the losing party basically is going to have to persuade the Supreme Court that it, that the damages issue is worth its attention. Uh, and so soon after Petrella, uh, the the court may not want to take another case about latches. But at the same time, the Federal Circuit has now spoken on bond, albeit narrowly, and. Uh, it, uh, wow, I think its chances for cert likely are going to uh, depend on what the justices think of the merits of the move. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that SCA hygiene is a very plausible case. It's interesting, as was mentioned earlier today, that the dissent, I mean, it's a six to five decision, and the dissent leads with rent meat for the Supreme Court in saying patent law is governed by the same common law principles methods of statutory interpretation and procedural rules as other areas of civil litigation. So it's pushing the button of patent-specific rule here. Citing Teva and eBay right. and all of the, the, the greatest hits. And, and, I, but I, and I completely agree with Willie's. It really comes down to a decision on whether this is right. Because if it's right on the merits, then why should the Supreme Court bother with it? But because of the Federal Circuit's rule, if it's wrong on the merits and it's now locking in a latches rule, you do have to wonder, are litigants really going to be preserving this issue? Will this be the sort of cert petition that once this is denied, we're not going to see any others? Um, so that that is definitely going to watch. Um, in terms of other cases that you'll see on the list in your packet, the um, Omega v. Costco case is interesting because it's bounced around through the courts. It had the copyright exhaustion issue that was eventually settled in Kurtzang after the court was unable to settle it in this case because of an even division. Um, the issue is very interesting and I think dovetails with Judge McEwen's speech today about the uses of copyright because what Omega was doing was it got a very small logo, um, got it copyrighted, and then it was putting it on the back of its watches and then trying to use that to be able to control against unauthorized imports under then existing law um, since change, saying that its international sales wouldn't have exhausted its copyright. Um, the case is in a very strange posture because the district court, after all the dust settled in the Kurtzang case, the district court treated it as a copyright misuse case, um, which always catches attention because copyright misuse is still an evolving and um, very uncertain. But basically, the court was irritated at the idea of using this small, not readily visible copyrighted element to try to be controlling the, the uncopyrighted article itself. Um, and so it ended up finding copyright misuse and awarding attorney's fees. When it came up to the Ninth Circuit, it reached a strange result, which was it dodged the copyright misuse question by saying, well, under Kurtzang, you, you exhausted your patent rights when you had Sorry, you exhausted your copyright rights via an authorized foreign sale. And so that goes away. And we affirm the attorney's rights. And so it's, wait a minute, because they didn't then have any substantive analysis of the basis of the attorney's rights. I don't see this as a great candidate for a grant because it seems so unusual and one-off. It is interesting that the cert petition did ask outright for summary reversal. 
this is the this is the situation which you can see the court saying we don't want to spend our time with this, but it is really strange to uphold attorney's fees without analyzing the basis, and so maybe we'll write a two-page opinion that just says sort of that doesn't make sense, we're sending this back down, or they'll just let it go as they do with fairness. Um, another case on the list um, that was one of the many recent Federal Circuit unbanked proceedings is the Suprema, the ITC case. Um, interesting question there. The, the International Trade Commission's jurisdiction um, was based on having jurisdiction over, the key quote is, articles that infringe. Um, it's a little bit of a mismatch because it's, it's talking about the articles of goods themselves um, in a way that's out of sync with most of the infringement statutes, which are talking about the actions of people and what they're doing. And so what does it mean, articles that infringe? And so the panel had narrowed that, and for, for purposes of inducement theories, um, it basically said the analysis looks at the time the product reaches the border. And so there are ways in which you could have an article that infringes the infringing importation under 271A. Um, when the article itself maps onto the contributory infringement language in 271C, you could have liability. But for 271B, for inducement infringement, at the moment the article is coming into the country, that's not an article that infringes because the act of direct infringement won't happen until subsequent steps are taken in the country. The court took this en banc and, and reversed that and said, no, um, articles that infringe can cover, you know, if the act of inducement has occurred when it's coming border, even if the infringement hasn't matured in direct infringement, that would be true. They analogized it to saying, for, for inducement, normally, you're, you're sort of found liable at your acts at one point in time. You may get off the hook later if it turns out there's no act of direct infringement. But the, the key thing in the case, and I think the thing that, that puts the brakes on it for potential Supreme Court review, is at the end of the day, the, the Federal Circuit wasn't putting its own imprint on the statute. Rather, it was saying there's an ambiguity here. The agency, the ITC here, has been charged with, by Congress. We think it has gap-filling authority here, so we're going to give its interpretation Chevron deference. And the question is close enough that we're not going to say it's an unreasonable interpretation. So I think that makes it a less attractive candidate to the Supreme Court because it's not what we see in these cases where there's a stark sort of statutory interpretation question where the federal circuit's going one way and the Supreme Court's just going to come and go another way. Rather, it's a situation where if there's ambiguity in the middle and you have Chevron deference to the agency, then does the Supreme Court really envision itself coming out with any different result than the federal circuit reach? So my prediction would be that there would not be a Supreme so uh, one case to just mention that I'm just going to mention quickly before I talk about the ones I actually want, I really want to talk about um, kind of picks up on some of the themes we've already talked about, and that's Lexmark versus Impression. Uh, that is only at the Federal Circuit in bank stage. The in bank oral argument, I believe, is oral uh, October 2nd. But that raises some of these same issues. It's an, uh, another patent exhaustion uh, question about when uh, the sale of a product uh, exhausts patent rights. And it also raises this question of, we have a Supreme Court copyright decision. How does that, does that automatically, do, should we import that into patent law? Are patent law and copyright uh, sufficiently similar that uh, the, the decision being the first day decision that if um, uh, a foreign sale uh, uh, exhausts the cop, uh, copyright rights? And the question is, that, is that also true for, for a foreign sale uh, and patent? And the Federal Circuit has previously said, no, selling it abroad does not exhaust your United States patent rights. Uh, and that question is, uh, is raised uh, there in Lexmark, as is a uh, question about restrictions on sales. When you sell something, requiring it to be then uh, reused or uh, sent back after one, uh, one use, is that, does that exhaust your patent rights? So that's just at the bank stage here, but it's worth noting because the Federal Circuit uh, ordered sua sponte in, ba in bank after the uh, panel oral argument without a petition. 
uh, and also has allowed uh, uh, Amiki to participate in oral argument, which is somewhat rare, though I think it also has to do with the difference in um, experience of, of the attorneys on the two sides. Uh, but tough to tell yet whether that's going to go to the Supreme Court until we know how the federal circuit comes out on, on that issue. Uh, the two cases I'm really, uh, I'm interested in personally are uh, Halo Electronics versus Pulse Electronics and Stryker versus Zimmer, which raised a similar issue. I actually found out, uh, and going back over the Stryker, the petition was filed by the sponsor of our reception afterwards. I assure you that did that not influence my uh, uh, choice of, uh, of Stryker as a case of interest. So these cases um, uh, relate to the fallout from the Octane Fitness decision. In Octane Fitness, uh, the Federal Circuit had applied, had previously applied a two-part test to determine whether a case was exceptional for purposes of awarding attorney's fees. The case had to be uh, uh, objectively baseless and uh, uh, subjectively in bad faith. Um, and that that uh, two-part test under Section 285 for attorney's fees is, is a parallel to the test the court applies under Section 284 for determining whether there's willful infringement for purposes of treble damages. Uh, and, and for a long time, the Federal Circuit had interpreted those two provisions in harmony. In Octane Fitness, the Supreme Court reverses on Section 285. And it says, uh, to, to uh, show an exceptional case, uh, you don't have to meet this two-part test. We, we're looking basically for a case that stands out from other cases, a more open-ended kind of standard. Uh, the, Supreme, uh, the, sorry, the Federal Circuit, subsequent to that, has continued to apply its two-part objective baseless, subjective bad faith test in the context of willful infringement under Section 284. And so both of these petitions raise this question. They say 284 and 285 have already, always been interpreted in harmony. Supreme Court, you said two, the Federal Circuit's uh, test under 285 is too restrictive. Therefore, the test under 284 should be the same. It should be, is this case that stands out, not this objective baseless, uh, subjective bad faith uh, test. Why I'm interested in this case is I think it, it raises a lot of the themes we've seen in the uh, Supreme Court's kind of recent, uh, as we saw from the analytics, recent engagement with patent law. It raises a lot of the same themes. You have this question of whether the federal circuit is applying too rigid a rule rather than a more flexible standard. You have this question of whether the Federal Circuit has departed from, from general principles of law. You have this question of whether the Federal Circuit is too restrictively reading Supreme Court cases, simply uh, applying the explicit holding of those cases and not reading kind of the tea leaves of those cases. You have a lot of those same type of themes that would make me say that this, should, this is a case that's likely to be granted for cert. Also, you have a dissent and a dissent from rehearing and bank. You have amicus briefs, all of these things. The thing is, though, the Federal Circuit's uh, test for willful infringement and the way that the uh, Federal Circuit has developed that test since the Seagate decision in 2007 have actually made willful infringement pretty hard to prove. As long as a party has a reasonable claim construction position or a reasonable invalidity position or a reasonable non-infringement position, they can't be liable as a willful infringer uh, under this objective baselessness uh, test. And so that has been good for accused infringers and bad for patentees. For the Supreme Court to reverse and say, no, we should be applying uh, a more flexible, broader standard for uh, uh, trouble damages, willful infringement and the opportunity for trouble damages would be a benefit to patentees at the expense of accused infringer, infringers. And so in that way, the case would be inconsistent with a lot of uh, the Supreme Court's recent foray into patent cases, which has generally been seen as, um, uh, uh, as kind of cavity back some of uh, perceived pro patentee tendencies in the Federal Circuit. So the fact that these cases, these petitions, raise these kind of conflicting themes in uh, the relationship between the Supreme Court and Federal Circuit is what makes me uh, uh, particularly interested in them. Again, a lot of the hallmarks that would suggest um, that cert is a reasonable chance, but I mean, the, the, these guys get paid the bu uh, big bucks to, to predict. I, I just would like the Supreme Court to take it. Um, so looking back briefly, uh, just to last term, particularly some of the uh, analytics that um, Ed Lee offered us, it does seem like last term, 
Uh, compared to the term before, we have a much more fractured court where you had a lot of unanimous decisions. Two terms ago, last term, there's much few, many fewer unanimous decisions. And then also within the coalitions, we sometimes expect to see that seems to be fracturing, particularly among the conservative justices on some of the cases that they heard last term. So I was wondering if anyone has any thoughts on what's going on internally among the justices in trying to deal with some of these IP cases. I, I mean, I think that they are realizing that some of these cases are harder than they might have first appeared. And so the, the days of the sense of just sort of the federal circuit's out of control and we're just going to be unanimous, so, you know, we can all agree on that's crazy, that's crazy, may be breaking down a little bit. I mean, I think it's healthy for the system. I think some of the unanimous decisions had loose language in them that you wouldn't necessarily have found if they had had a pressure, the pressure of a dissent. So I think it's it's actually a sign of the the maturity of the Supreme Court's engagement with this area of the law that it's settling into a pattern where it's not just reflexively saying you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. We don't even have to think about this. This is a no-brainer. But rather saying, okay, there are there are actually arguments on both sides, and we're going to air these um, full disputes, and hopefully the law that comes out of it in the majority opinion will be stronger. On the ideological differences, I was actually interested to see that in, in the analytics. Um, it, it's To me, it's not necessarily surprising, other than perhaps the, the unanimity of the liberal justices. Uh, in I mean, at least in patent law, what you see is kind of weird political co coalitions in Congress that doesn't normally break down nicely along ideological lines, uh, where you have kind of weird coalitions of certain types of Republicans or conservatives on, uh, and, and certain types of uh, Democrats or liberals, and, and you get these weird mixes. So it's not surprising to me to see a uh, uh, breakdown on the conservative side of the justices. The only thing that would be somewhat surprising, I guess, would be unanimity on the liberal side. Yeah, I mean, there are there are IP cases and there are IP cases. Right? There are patent cases and there are patent cases. Some are straight up statutory construction cases. Some are not. Right? And you know, to see the justices, you know, some are stare decisis cases and some are not. And, you know, the justices have an approach to stare decisis or to statutory interpretation that they tend to follow across, you know, across section of cases rather than kind of an, I, an IP specific approach. And, you know, Justice Scalia's approach to stare decisis is quite different from Justice Thomas's approach to stare decisis. Uh, just, and, um, you know, for that reason, it's not all, it's not all that surprising to see them on different sides. Same with statutory interpretation. I think the you know, question mentioned Justice Scalia and Justice Alito. You know, quite different in statutory cases. You know, whether it's involving the you know education amendments to the you know to the to an appropriations bill or the patent. Act. So, Tom, can I just follow up the idea of, of of maturity the Supreme Court? So they're taking it more seriously. They're appreciating the difficulties of these issues, perhaps more so than in the past. I mean, I think it may be too early to declare that, given the unanimity we saw. Do you see, so my question was, sort of the appreciation of complexity, is that leading towards some, in your view, better decisions? Is there wisdom that's developing here, or are they just getting deeper in the morass like everyone else is? No, I, I think it's wisdom. I think it may also go hand in hand with slowing down a little bit on the grant rate. I think just the, this recognition that things that on first blush may seem very simple um, are more complicated and there are multiple viewpoints here. Maybe, maybe it will result in a sort of growing respect of what the Federal Circuit has had to grapple with as the Supreme Court has to do this year after year. Well, picking up on that point, the Federal Circuit hasn't fared particularly well. We have their decisions being vacated or reversed in what, seven of eight patent decision uh, over the last two terms. So is that indicative of anything that we should be thinking about or concerned with? Um, I mean, the thing that is most interesting to me is to see how the non-proxy entity narrative plays out in a period where you've had so much change. Because last term, you had so many patent cases, 
you basically had groups that filed the same amicus brief in every single case. They said, this, this is, I mean, just wrote something, this is absolutely terrible, we're facing all these frivolous claims, and the solution is fill in the blank. You know, make it easier for us to get attorney's fees. Lots of hand-wringing at that time, by the way, of not necessarily wanting that same rule to turn back on them and willfulness. Um, make it easier for us to, to challenge the patents as indefinite, you know, section, give us a section 101 ability, cut back on the law of divided infringement and mine might be Akamai. So it was a sort of all-purpose problem and then fill in the blank solution for whatever the case was. Um, and so you still saw, I mean, it, it was mentioned on the panel, you sort of saw this fight making it into the opinions itself in the Como case, but you do wonder then whether there's a period of reassessment in the sense of if you change six doctrines all for the same reason, do you take a pause and say, okay, well, what's happening here? How is this playing out? That's one possibility, or do you just keep running with it, which quite frankly may be what happens because that's there certainly has been a tendency, I would say, in the past of the Supreme Court when it gets fixated on the issue of you know, too much securities litigation, too many prisoner suits, um, getting on that pendulum and swinging it pretty far and not necessarily causing it to take stock. So we'll, we'll have to see um, whether it just continues to be a salient argument or whether they say, wait a minute, we've changed a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, the, the reversal rate, it's tough to know what to make of that. I mean, what, what Judge McKeown was saying is basically the Ninth Circuit has a pretty high, just in absolute terms, reversal rate, but yet that's not the highest among circuits. Um, and, and I think it's also a, a factor here that federal or Supreme Court review of the Federal Circuit is somewhat distinct from other forms of Supreme Court review because the Supreme Court is generally in error correction mode rather than in circuit split resolution. Um, it, it's not, the cases come to the Supreme Court largely not because there's a split in which uh, the, the Supreme Court could either choose the side of the petitioner or the other side of the split. They come because there's some sort of sense that something went wrong below that needs to be corrected because the Federal Circuit, otherwise the Federal Circuit has Nation, uh, exclusive jurisdiction in patent cases. So it's not particularly surprising that the cases that the Supreme Court is getting engaged in are cases where it is, it is going to want to correct. So. so the last question for the panel, I'm going to aim toward Willie and Tom. And both of you had, uh, have been having pretty good success before the Supreme Court. Uh, lately, so I was wondering if you have any thoughts on what goes into putting together a, a persuasive and effective argument before the Supreme Court. I think on the merits, uh, the the main thing, uh, frankly, is to not be captured by the patent context of the case, you know, or, or to a lesser extent, the trademark, you know, uh, con uh, context of the case, and to make, you know, to make cases speak to the justices as generalists that uh, to, to the extent possible to appeal to principles of whether it's appellate review, district court competency, uh, uh, basic economics uh, that the justices are familiar with. Because I think there is a, there is a sense that they are, they are comfortable interpreting statutes. They are less comfortable with the technology and with sort of the arcana of patent law. And if you make it, the more you make cases about the arcana of patent law, I think the more you push the justices outside where they're comfortable. I think if you can say this, this case is about a patent, but it's just the same as if it were about a contract. I mean, it, it, that basically is literally the, the pitch that we made in the uh, But you know, it happens in other contexts as well. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that we trust district courts to do. You know, it's just like you know, attorney's fees in cases against the government. Uh, those positions have a lot of appeal. I guess that's my one. Yeah, and I, I always see it as a two-step move, which is you're, you're trying to put forward a position that seems very simple and easy to go with, and at the same time playing on the sort of complexity of the other side's position and the uncertainty.
uncertainty as to how that's going to play out. And, and this isn't just in Astartes. I mean, this certainly played out in Kimball, where we said, my god, they're asking for the rule of reason. This is going to be terrible. Um, but it plays out, you know, I'm arguing in November a federal circuit case, which shouldn't shock people. You, we didn't miss something. It's a veteran's case. It's not a patent case. But the strategy in that case is very much, you know, we have a very simple, straightforward interpretation of the statute, and the government's interpretation is one that seems to change depending on what time of year it is, and it sort of links in and out of existence, whether our particular goals have met. And so you just presented this justice with this sort of reassurance of here's a clear, easy path you, path, you can wrap your head around the implications of going down this road. Going over here, you begin to get very nervous and say, what, what are they really asking me to do? And that can be very effective in advocacy because at the end of the day, they, they get nervous too about the unintended consequences. Right, and I think even the Nautilus case, which I don't know if you were involved in, but we were not, you know, uh, you know what is an example of that. The court took the case to reverse you know, pretty clearly uh, because it thought, oh my god, indefiniteness doctrine is too weak and we need to amp it up. And the respondent did an excellent job, aided by the government, of telling the court, don't go crazy here. Right? The other side is asking for a principle that every patent that is not perfectly clear, in other words, if, any re if there's any reasonable room for disagreement, that patent is invalid. Boom. And the court you know, looked over the abyss and decided to retreat and said, basically, OK, we're going to smack the federal circuit for saying some loose things going to encourage the federal circuit to be a bit a bit more rigorous, maybe. Um, and uh, you know, what we think that the respondent has kind of the more sensible position. They weren't defending the world as it was, but they were saying that the petitioner's argument uh, was going to make the world much, much more different than the respondent wanted it to be. And that's, that's what the court wound up embracing. And I think you saw that nervousness in Como v. Cisco as well, where there, there was a sense of, if we recognize the good faith belief in invalidity, then are we really just ending the inducement suits here? Whereas it was easier for them to wrap their heads around the idea, well, if it's invalid, you're going to have a defense. And if it's not, then maybe you know you can rely on there are other defenses here. So maybe that seems like more of a modest approach. Are there any questions for our panelists? Very much so, and, and you know, one of the things we could note is that the government filed no brief at all in Global Tech, uh, only to come back in Tumil and say basically, uh, we, we, you know, we want to undo some of some of uh, what was done there and put a funny nose and glasses on it and not call it uh, and not call it uh, overruling. Um, but absolutely, you know, the PTO does not have a monopoly on, you know, on kind of a cl the client interests in these patent cases. Uh, some of them really are just you know pure patent law, but others are not. You know they have they have uh, implications for you know the FDA regulation of pharmaceuticals. They have implications for innovation policy more broadly. And you know while the PTO at the federal circuit you know tends to drive the litigation position of the government, you know it's it's a brief for the United States. It's not a brief for the Patent and Trademark Office. You know the director of the PTO is an inferior officer who works for the president, and sometimes she gets overruled. And I think the office just very consciously tries to maintain its credibility with the court. I'm sure Willie was doing this when he was in the office. They, and so they very often become attractive to the court because they provide a middle position that says, well, on the one hand this, on the other hand this, and you can chart this middle course here. 
And when they get into trouble is, I mean, the Como case, that, that was rough on the Solicitor General's office because they were basically saying, take a sentence that says we hold and read it in context to, to mean something different, um, which prompted Justice Scalia to ask a little argument, how stupid do you think we are? Like, you know, you think we couldn't read our old opinion there? Um, and I think that is, that is tough because by and large, the office is very careful, I think, to not put itself in that position where it's butting heads or seeming to push the justices too far in one direction, but instead wants to maintain this neutral voice, broad set of interests for the United States. Right. And, and the, the issue of signing the brief, I mean, I think it's a recurring issue. It's not limited to the patent context, you know, but, uh, you know, frankly, when an agency refuses to sign the brief, it is kind of a deviation from the idea that the United States speaks with one voice. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's something that the just, some justices take more note of than others. The Chief Justice has been known to ask, you know, why didn't Agency X sign the brief? And it, it would not surprise me at all in the future to see the SG uh, starting to uh, have only the Justice Department lawyers sign briefs in the future, just, just because it's gotten tedious and, frankly, a bit juvenile sometimes. Yeah, and, uh, well, and, and you also run into interesting situations, which was why didn't the PTO yeah, sign the exactly. Kimball brief? And this, this became the subject of forum discussions um, but as I've been assured many times, it was an accident. They left the leaves off when they signed the brief to the printer. The PTO wanted to sign the brief, and so sort of what does that mean? Sometimes it's just human institution you may not get it quite right. Right, and, and there are discussions even more petty, such as whose name goes above right. who else's name, uh, which for a long time was resolved in favor of what order was the cabinet department created in. But every now and then that leads to the, the Department of State being at the top of the brief that they have no business being at the top of. I think, I think the government's changed that very, very petty practice. Well, our, a lot of time has ended, so I'd like to ask you to all join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific discussion. Uh, a couple of housekeeping matters before we conclude. Uh, and remarkably, we're on time, so thank goodness. Um, if you have filled out a evaluation form, uh, which are available also at the front desk, uh, please remember to turn it in. Uh, we value your feedback. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, a few more people that I didn't get a chance to thank in the morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Halkrant for his support, uh, Susan Lewers in the, in the um, Alumni Development Office who helped with uh, securing a lot of the sponsors. I thank, of course, all the sponsors who basically, in, with their generous donations, have made this conference possible for the past six years. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Patricia O'Neill, who is incredible with the organization of this event and logistics and getting all the speakers here with flights and hotels. Uh, I want to thank um, our two IP fellows, Patrick Gould and uh, Joy Shang. I don't know if Joy is still here, but um, who also have been incredible in helping out uh, various logistics of the conference. Uh, I want to thank all the students, uh, President of the IPLS, Tina Thomas, and our other, uh, uh, whole slew of uh, students who have volunteered time uh, the, uh, during today to timekeep and also to uh, work at the registration table. And to thank uh, Sue Jaden and the wonderful staff of the AV, AV department uh, who have uh, made this conference go without any technical difficulties. Uh, I, also would like to thank all of our excellent speakers and moderators who have traveled from the East Coast, West Coast, and in between to make this conference uh, a huge success. And then finally, uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, who showed up today and who stuck it out to the very end uh, to make this conference a success. I thought the presentations and discussion were excellent and very informative and uh, engaging and I, ha I hope it left you with a lot to think about for um, your respective IP areas that you follow. Um, and with that, I think I can conclude uh, the Skipper Conference for 2015. We will have a reception uh, right now uh, for the next hour or so, hosted by or sponsored by McAndrews. Uh, so I hope you have time to stay for a little bit and chat and uh, share in the beverages and, uh, and food. Thank you so much. We'll see you um, maybe next year or two years from now. Thank you.